Okay, very good morning to you. Anthony here from the desk, Friday 24th of July. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you are watching this briefing there. We've got a brand new video coming out from Milan, a follow-up to the video he did about what is algorithmic trading. He's put together a video of five points to creating your own algorithm, five things to be aware of. So really great video, I've already watched it. It's gonna be released on Saturday, so if you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell notification and you'll get an alert as soon as that goes out. Uh, otherwise, let's get straight to it and talk about the markets for this morning. And yeah, the the risk off sentiment has continued on from the, the negative close on Wall Street. So overnight, the Asia Pacific session generally lower. The main Chinese CSI index was down about 3%. Remember that was the main index of the largest companies I was talking about just about a week ago when Chinese markets were just moving um, powerful to the upside. Uh, now starting to see a bit of reversal over renewed US-China tension. So we'll look at that in a bit more detail shortly. In terms of the heat map, the big tech stocks, it's almost inevitable as when everyone starts talking about how the proportional representation as we were talking in the briefing yesterday of so few becomes so big. Um, we get a bit of a pullback. So Amazon, which of course had been on fire recently, and at the beginning of the week, remember they in the singular day they were up 8%. They were down about 3.7. Uh, similar losses observed elsewhere. Microsoft post earnings were down about 4.3. Apple down about 4.5%. So some of those big tech outperformers, those mega cap tech stocks, just pulling back a little bit. So in, you know, in regard to the NASDAQ, all major US indices were lower yesterday. It's the first time we've had a downside day of in excess of 1% across three indices in, in a while. Uh, and you can see just the, the size of the move here from the sell-off breaking out through what was a period of relative consolidation through uh, the prior day's price action on the 22nd. Uh, and a breakdown through quite a key technical point of previous resistance and then support on that session on Wednesday. Uh, and then a breakdown to the lower bound of the range which we've been trading in the middle of last week. So all in all, I mean, if you look on a daily continuation chart here on the NASDAQ, you know, yesterday's sell-off was, was meaningful, but generally speaking on the bigger trend, the 21 DMA, we are trading just below there at the moment, and that was a strong level of support of which could be meaningful here in terms of the price action for today from a, at least a technical perspective. You can see that area at 10.505 was an area of support back on the 7th and, and the 8th of July also had a false break and then retested on the 16th but acted as good support as well on the 23rd, so yesterday's session, but we have gone below there now with the NASDAQ future already down about 77 points going to the European Open. So it will be quite interesting because any further push to the downside, there's obviously quite a big level that would come in um, quite a bit lower down at 10.292 in the NASDAQ future. Um, a nice level here of resistance and support and that trend line then that dates back all the way to really April's price activity that I'd be keeping a very close eye on. So definitely here, there is a possibility then technically for a further move lower. I guess going into Friday, we've got some major data of the week coming out shortly, the PMI numbers, if they fail um, to really excite and given the fact that US data this week from consumer confidence to yesterday's jobless claims have all been on the disappointing side. And as we were kind of discussing yesterday about this Citigroup surprise index now having peaked, coming lower as data points now, um, if anything, coming out on the downside rather than in this string of upside surprises we had had for such a long period. A little bit of profit taking there in the NASDAQ I don't think is wholly that surprising. Uh, that would be a big level though if we get down to challenge there if that does materialize today. Uh, but all in all, I think a little bit of a pullback and that what we have seen through the second half of this week after we hit all-time highs, I don't think is hugely surprising. Could we see some more downside down to those lower level targets? I think perhaps we could and that could indeed happen today. But you know, looking at the S&P on, uh, on a daily continuation, uh, again, similar to the NASDAQ, there's a really key level here on any pullback that I'd be particularly interested in watching today 
and that's around that 3200 or 30, 3196 here. You can see that, that area where during the mid part of July, going really from the 15th through to the 20th, that that was such a strong level of support. And so if we did remain under some pressure, that's not too far away. We've already got to go about another 20 points here in the S&P to get to that area. So if we do see continuation of yesterday's kind of risk off sentiment, keep an eye on that around that 3200, 3196 in the NASDAQ. If we get a simultaneous break with the NASDAQ on those on that longer term kind of trend channel, then things could get a bit bit spicy going into the weekend and, and certainly then you know the one trade that probably is, is a winner in either direction is gold because it's already been moving higher with relative calm but then it just gets another you know kick higher when we get this risk off trade as well so such a good asset that's played out well recently and we hit 1900 in the futures uh, yesterday and we're not that far off then of the all-time high sitting just 20 bucks above that level uh, the all-time high well the the 1900 came late in yesterday afternoon when things really got fired up um, shortly after the comics open and then silver taking a bit of a breather from the the rapid gains that have been seen throughout this week what near 20 percent and so that trend line which we were talking about in the briefing yesterday you can see when it broke quite a severe move lower at the time uh, and then we found respectively some resistance back at the same point so quite a lot of people obviously watching around these same levels and then we've we've just consolidated if anything uh, at around the 22 and a half being the floor to some of the recent price activity here for silver uh, so that also worth keeping on again silver comparative to gold uh, a little bit more volatile so you just need to be mindful of that if you're trading that asset and so the technical levels will be quite key to see some quite rapid movements from point A to point B uh, as speculative traders have been um, that's been one of the main focal points that they've been locking in on this week has been the price of silver um, so let's run through some of the headlines then um, and gonna start off with the, the situation here overnight uh, this has come of course after that move we saw from the US earlier in the week so China has come out and ordered the US to close the Chengdu consulate in its retaliation move uh, that after the US forced closure of the Chinese mission in Houston um, we had Donald Trump speak overnight talking about the China trade deal means much less to him now and the Secretary of State Michael Pompeo was saying some pretty inflammatory comments uh, in reference to China as well last night so this is the latest uh, and certainly it just helps uh, further fuel well, I think more if anything is a little bit of profit taking on this run up that we've had in markets in the first half of this week you just have a little bit of a catalyst then to trigger um, the kind of removal of some of those short term longs uh, that were chasing that market higher so where do we go from here with this issue uh, I think this is probably about the most we'll hear of it for this week can't really see too much more in the way of further escal escalation at this point. Um, the one thing, of course, that has been happening, I'm going to talk about in a second, is the COVID situation in America is getting worse. And there has been, I think, quite a clear, identifiable trend between the worse that COVID gets domestically, the more venomous the US attack on um, China becomes in order to kind of frame the narrative that it's China's fault and to um, I guess discount any um, accountability for for the situation as it's developing at the moment in America. Um, the response then from China, you probably remember the Global Times editor Hu Xixin. Uh, he's talked about Pompeo specifically uh, and basically taken a few pop shots of his own, uh, and then also been talking about this headline that we've had this morning um, in regards to this kind of reciprocal principle and and so on. Um, the other thing, of course, though, that was in focus yesterday was this, this jobless situation. This does lead me then to a bit of a wider discussion point about the US economy and its economic recovery, or at least, at least its trajectory that it may or might have been on. And this did cause a bit of interest yesterday. Uh, the jobless claims largely for many weeks have been a little bit of a non-event, but it was the first basically the first uptick in US jobless claims we've had since March. And March, of course, is when we had this this massive spike up to around 6.6 .6 million but generally speaking 
after that initial knee-jerk reaction to the pandemic status and then the full lockdown that happened during the latter part of March and, and through the month of April, the jobless claims have been decreasing, albeit at a decelerating rate. However, a bit of an uptick yesterday just made people a little bit nervous. And why does it make people nervous? Well, don't forget as well, we've got these talks ongoing throughout the entire week um, with the US GOP stimulus bill likely will not be released now until Monday uh, amid disagreements over jobless benefits and other issues. So a lot of people, of course, watching this closely because Trump has blamed Democrats for scuttling his idea for a payroll tax cut. Other areas of contention, of course, remain around this expanded unemployment benefit scheme, which provides around additional $600 uh, a week, a cushion for out-of-work Americans. And that is due to expire, of course, at the end of the month on July 31st. So again, this exploration of some of these programs just making markets as well as a little apprehensive. I would say, though, that this is, for me, politically, I wouldn't be too surprised by this. This is always, you know, although these deadlines, uh, the timeline is diminishing, this is just a natural order of things of, of compromise tending to come right at the, at the last minute. But certainly if it didn't, that does raise some complications perhaps about the um, the economic recovery in the US. And all of this, of course, is coming, admit an ongoing COVID situation. Uh, this is the latest looking at those kind of key hotspots California, Texas, Florida, and Arizona. And you should, as you can see, a little bit different from the last time I did bring up this graphic. We are somewhat leveling out, or at least the trajectory of increases is decelerating slightly from the more rapid, steeper trajectory we were on just a week or two ago. Um, but a few things to show you on, on this front. Let me just bring a shot into screen and I'll make it a bit bigger. Uh, this one here is looking at a few different things. We've got number of positive cases. Uh, so new positive cases now are a new high, 66,870. Uh, we've also got um, hospitalizations at a new high in the US and deaths, the highest since the 5th of June uh, as well at the moment, looking on a seven day average. So, you know, it's definitely one of those things here where if you think about the COVID situation, if you think about the the exploration and the political uh, difficulties of getting further stimulus to support the economy um, at the moment, then this could all have a great influence on the shape or, or, or almost this idea of a double dip implications for the US economy. So there's definitely some reason for the movement I think that we saw yesterday. Uh, and you, you throw in the factor of markets. You know, if you remember, on the 13th of this month, that was when the markets have these episodes of getting super overextended. And uh, that was that day when, um, you know, Tesla was up some 20% in just a single day. It's almost like you get these these, these catalyst moments uh, that, are, that are really symbolic almost for the initiation of profit taking. Uh, Tesla would have been one there. And, you know, earlier this week with Amazon up 8%, you know, these phenomenal increases and we hit record highs, that, that that retest of the record high in the NASDAQ midweek. It's almost like, right, yeah, that's, it, that's it. time to take just a little bit off the table. You know, medium term horizon, I don't think it's right. This is this is the commencement of a significant correction in the US equity markets. I don't think that is the case. Uh, not yet. But certainly is there could there be a potential for some downside today, I think, possibly. Uh, I would not I would not be too surprised if that was going to materialize. But again, those key levels I suggested in the uh, US indices are going to be the ones to watch. Um, the other thing, of course, was earnings. We did have Intel aftermarket last night, and they basically warned on production delay um, ways that further weighed on kind of negative sentiment that was increasing last night. Um, I'll look at their shares in a second, but the, the seven nanometer chip process very specific for the company is now trending around 12 months below its um, or behind its intended target for, for its rollout. And what happened to Intel shares? Well, they got absolutely hammered in aftermarket trade. You can see them here, they're trading at 54, they were down 10.6%. Uh, but one company's um, failings is another company's gain. Uh, and given the space of which Intel operate in is a fairly small sector, in this kind of chip making environment, well, one of their biggest competitors, AMD, they were up about 8% in aftermarket. Again, no fault of their own. This was just 
on the back of the, the coming out of Intel and one of their major competitors benefiting in that situation. Uh, on the earnings front, just to be aware of, you do have a couple pre-open that are worth keeping an eye on, Visa and American Express. Visa is around 5% of the Dow in terms of a market capitalization. Uh, Amex is about 2.5%. So, you know, a good 7.5% of the Dow coming out pre-market. Honeywell, Schlumberger also uh, fairly sizable in terms of market cap. So a few things to keep an eye on there as well. And then on the weather front, for any energy traders, I've uh, just been keeping an eye on the NHC website because of uh, Tropical Storm Hannah, which currently is close proximity to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, if I just bring up this chart, Hannah is forecast to strengthen and is expected to bring Tropical Storm Force winds to portions of the Texan coast where a Tropical Storm warning is, effect, is in effect. My understanding is that a number of facilities there from oil majors and refiners are on standby at the moment. Uh, it is expected to produce heavy rains across portions of Louisiana, southern Texas and northern Mexico. However, if you actually look at the trajectory here on the mapping and the projected direction and timings, it should not have too much of an influence. It's kind of just missing some of the key critical areas within that um, particular location, but definitely worth just keeping a half an eye on perhaps. Uh, but again, should not really be too much of an issue um, throughout the rest of the day. Um, that is pretty much the main bulk of the news. The main thing is now forward looking um, for the PMIs. Now we have had some UK data out this morning. Uh, the UK retail sales month to month came in at 13.9% above the expected 8%, but sterling really hasn't reacted a great deal, if anything at all, to that number. Remember Brexit, we've been talking about a lot of political kind of elements now that are being factored in and certainly a bit of a divergence on the fundamental perspective comparative to the euro solid performance this week. Uh, euro still trading in excess of that 116 mark. Uh, for the PMIs though, these will be interesting and you know, could this fan the flames if you like of some of that brewing negative sentiment we saw develop yesterday? Um, because what's quite interesting is we got the French and the German PMIs this morning, of course, followed up by the UK at 9.30. And most of these readings are anticipated to bounce back into expansionary territory after being highly depressed um, amid that kind of major April slight bounce back in May into these now June and this being the July readings. So if they remain suppressed and these numbers disappoint, Again, that could be quite interesting because it just comes at a point where um, you know, sentiment generally is a little bit fragile this morning. So for the French numbers, uh, they're expected to be pretty solid actually. 53.2 for manufacturing, 52.3 for the uh, services number. Both would be, particularly on the service side, quite a strong improvement that analysts are anticipating. On the German front, manufacturing is still expected to remain uh, in contraction, but a bounce from around 45.2 to roughly around 48 is the consensus. Services moving back above the 50 marker. And then in the UK, manufacturing expected at 52 from 51 spot one, or, or from 50 spot one. And the services in the UK, obviously the, the more important metric expected to move back up to 51.5 from 47.1. Um, the US, that number also will be coming out alongside new home sales and the Baker Hughes rig count for the, the main releases in the US afternoon. Um, this is expected manufacturing to bounce again to 51.5 and services to 51, both having been below 50 before. So I think it'll be quite telling uh, just from almost a symbolic point of view because we're right on that tipping point now uh, on that key area of being expansion or, or contraction. So. Um, if we get a disappointment, it will just be interesting to see if we get a bit of a retest on those lower levels again. Uh, if we get outperformance, uh, talking the other side of the book, let's say the numbers in Europe, particularly from the German perspective and France on the service side, if they come out and really bust on the upside expectations in a positive fashion, well, all the more reason then for a little bit of further elevation in the euro currency. And if that comes in the context then of the US number being weak, then you might see a further breakout in the euro on the upside today uh, to finish the week on a really firm footing for the currency pair. So you know, a few things to think about. Um, all right, that is it.
nothing much more else for me to add. So remember again, if I could kindly ask you to subscribe to the channel, we really appreciate your support for growing our community. Um, you know, feel free to engage, leave comments, always happy the team and I to help where we can. And as I said, Milan's got a new video, uh, one of our tech guys coming out talking about algorithmic trading on Saturday. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. Uh, and I wish you a fantastic weekend. All right, take care.